Hello, my name is Derek Mitchell, and I am the president of the National Democratic Institute. I will be your host for this DemWorks podcast. For more than 35 years, NDI has been honored to work with thousands of courageous and committed small D Democrats around the world to help countries develop the institutions, practices, and skills necessary for democracy's success. During that time, we have conducted programs in more than 150 countries, and today maintain more than 50 offices globally. Through our DemWorks podcasts and videos, we're engaging in conversation with those who have been on the front lines of democratic development work. They'll share what they do and how they do it, their on-the-ground experiences and analysis, the challenges they face, the obstacles they overcome, and the unique national context in which they must operate, and in the process show how democracy works. In this episode, we will discuss the unmistakable rise of authoritarian influence around the world, with a specific focus on China. June 4 marks 30 years since the violent suppression of public demonstrations for political reform in Beijing that occurred in and around Tiananmen Square. I was in Beijing myself somewhat by chance the month before in May of 1989 to witness the height of those demonstrations. Despite the turmoil and bloodshed that followed, however, not only has China's Communist Party survived intact since, but it has thrived as China has become an economic powerhouse if not a budding global superpower. To examine the implications of China's rise, particularly on democratic norms and values around the world in recent years, I am joined by my very good friends, Chris Walker and Shanti Kalathal from the National Endowment for Democracy, otherwise known as the NED. Chris and Shanti are two of the most cutting edge scholars and writers on authoritarian influence operations working anywhere right now, and I'm proud to call them friends and colleagues. Chris Walker is the Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the NED and a leading strategic thinker on democratic development. He formerly served as Vice President for Strategy and Analysis at Freedom House. Chris just testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on China's role in the Western Hemisphere and is co-editor of Authoritarianism Goes Global, The Challenge to Democracy. Shanti Kalafal is Senior Director of the NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies her work at the NED has focused on the impact of information and communication technology on democratization and development, with a particular emphasis on Asia. Among many other qualifications and achievements, Shanti has served as a Hong Kong-based staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal Asia and lectures on international relations in the information age at Georgetown University. And we are turning the tables a bit on Chris and Shanti today, as they also co-lead a podcast over at the NED entitled Power 3.0, in which they engage in conversation with other experts about their work on authoritarian influence. And I encourage folks out there to give it a listen. That's Power 3.0. Chris and Shanti, welcome. Thank you for joining us at DemWorks. Thank you. Pleasure Great to be, be here. here. So let me start with you, Chris. Um, though in 2017, you both were instrumental in helping to popularize the concept of sharp power to describe the work of China and other authoritarian powers. Chris, can you share what, you, what that term sharp power means exactly and its connection to authoritarian influence? So thanks very much, Derek. Um, the, the idea of sharp power was an outgrowth of work we were doing at the forum over a period of time, looking at um, a number of uh, different sectors where um, the common understanding was that soft power was at work. And as authoritarian um, governments like those, say, in China or Russia, became more activist and more internationalist in their engagement globally, uh, they too were using at least the, the visible tools that have been associated with soft power in the realm, education, culture, media, and so forth. But as we look more closely at the way in which um, these tools were being applied and the effect they were having, they didn't always seem to have the characteristics of the customarily understood definition of soft power, which is um, power that attracts uh, and persuades mm -hmm. or otherwise enhances the image of the country that is um, engaged in that sort of activity. And as we look more closely at, for example, China's engagement in the university sector, the publishing sphere, and so forth, uh, it became clear that something else was at work and that in the end, um, at least in part, and this isn't true for all of the influence or all of the power that China or Russia is exerting, they can certainly exert, exert soft power uh, in certain spheres, but in the, in the idea sphere, uh, 
and in these key political areas, it became clear that in certain respects, this was more aimed at uh, censorship or otherwise degrading the integrity of independent institutions. And therefore, uh, we felt that the soft power moniker wasn't quite a fit for so many of the things that we found. Right, they're not really persuading. They're getting into societies and trying to coerce, using money. I mean, how are they going about doing this? So I, I think the term that, that I find most um, suitable in these discussions is the corrosive impact of this engagement. So um, just to use the publishing sector as, as one example, um, Nature Springer, which is one of the largest academic publishers, has decided, um, I think it was in 2017, to no longer publish on certain issues or include certain content at the behest of censors in Beijing. And uh, this is not an isolated incident. There was one other case that got some notoriety where Cambridge University Press decided to do something similar, and it was only in response, um, only as a result of the response of a host of scholars and activists and advocates who said, this simply doesn't make sense that a publisher operating from an open society, from a free environment, would make the decision not to publish um, in a candid and open way because um, of a setting that sets a much more restrictive sta standard. And I think it's instructive in this case because it was really civil society and other key players in open societies who shined a light on this decision. And then the management at Cambridge University uh, Press decided to reverse that decision, which was the right call in that case. And I think we see this replaying itself across a whole host of institutions today that really um, should cause all of us that have the privilege of living in free societies to think of how we set our own standards and defend them in the face of these encroachments on free speech and, and academic uh, speech and other such examples. Right. And in that case, Shanti, uh, it sounded like there was a reversal. It did not succeed, ultimately. Is China succeeding in its efforts globally? Where is it running into headwinds? How is it, how is it uh, achieving its goal, in your view? I think to the extent that uh, some of these influence efforts are running into headwinds, it's because, as Chris has just mentioned, civil society has actually managed to put a spotlight on some of them. However, I, I would say that in many countries and many regions throughout the world, actually, civil society doesn't actually have that capacity to shine a spotlight. So it's not really just about the traditional journalistic and civil society function of trying to increase accountability or transparency. But I think, in particular, if in vulnerable democracies, especially, journalists don't really know what they're looking for, if they aren't able to see some of these things for what they are, if they aren't able to scrutinize them and put them in context, they can be very easy to miss. Mm -hmm. And again, you're talking about vulnerable open societies where that basic capacity may not even exist. And so I think it really requires both an awareness of what the Chinese government, and I should really say the Chinese party state, is trying to do in many mm -hmm. of these regions, what are the objectives, and then from a democratic resilience perspective to try to increase that resilience. So it's not necessarily about combating that per se, it's more about you know, what are the values inherent in free societies and open societies that need to be defended and what role does civil society have to play in that? Right. And so what is what specifically are China's interests here? Are they What are they going for specifically when they try to deploy sharp power? What are they trying to coerce countries to do uh, specifically? Well, you know, I think it probably varies. You can you can probably break it down in traditional foreign policy or national security terms in a variety of contexts. But I think one common element and one theme I would emphasize is that the Chinese party state essentially doesn't act in a fundamentally different way outside of its borders. It doesn't act in a different way than mm -hmm. it does at home. And so it carries the same authoritarian values and the same propensity to try to perpetuate one party rule wherever it is operating. Um, you know, I think, well, I'll, I'll quote one scholar that we actually just talked to for our podcast, Samantha Hoffman, who has put it in terms of the party doesn't really make a distinction between the party within China's borders and the party without Mm -hmm. outside of China's borders. It draws the distinction between within the party and outside of the party. And if you see it in that way, then the 
the within borders, outside of borders distinction doesn't matter. And so inevitably, it's not necessarily just about trying to achieve a particular strategic interest. Um, it's really more, this is just the way that the party operates. Right. And in some way, is it about defending the party? I mean, ultimately, China's or the party's interest is to defend the the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. So in some ways, what they do externally may be in some ways defending the right um, and the values of the Chinese Communist Party. Is that legitimate, or do you think it's even beyond that, that they're trying to shape a world that's that's conforming to a different set of values, in, either in competition with the U.S. or otherwise? So I think there's, there's also um, some value in looking at how other authoritarian regimes operate when they have the capacity to operate beyond their borders. And I, I would put it in this term that with, and it's hard to think of exceptions to this case, but um, the animating principles that authoritarian governments operating beyond their borders uh, tend to use, privileged state control, which is something that they also value at home, it uh, tends to restrict political expression to the extent that's possible, and it privileges rule by law over rule of law. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at Russia's engagement in any number of places, southeastern Europe, central Europe, um, in a variety of ways in Africa, Latin America, you'll see similarities, not identical to what China does. They're different countries, different systems, but this notion of needing to uh, control is always there. And I think in China's case, from what we see, and it's it's really a pattern that deserves more research and more scrutiny, is that China's engagement, for example, in the commercial realm through BRI tends to be associated with um, efforts to suppress, suppress open discussion about the nature of the agreements. And so you can see versions of this, for example, with um, the standard gauge railway in Kenya or with the ECU 9-11 uh, technical uh, package that was given in Ecuador, or with the satellite um, facility in Patagonia in southern Argentina. Uh, and there are other examples I can offer in this context. Mm -hmm. Invariably, in all these cases, the wider society was not engaged in a discussion about the nature and the contours of what are often very significant agreements between uh, China or its surrogates, commercial surrogates, operating often in open settings, open societies. And it tends to be only later on where either investigative journalists from outside those countries or within those countries say, hey, what exactly happened here so that we see the sort of precarious arrangement with our debt obligations or with the um, uh, sovereignty that we've ceded to one degree or another Sri Lankan case is a very good one. Um, and how did we get here? And invariably, I think it's because the uh, lack of meaningful discussion as these big agreements were being set in place um, has facilitated this sort of problematic outcome. And so I think that is something that comes naturally to authoritarian regimes, this idea to limit the sunlight on activity what they do at home, and to the extent local environments permit this when they're abroad, they will certainly take advantage of that. And I think this is just apropos of what Shanti was describing. It really requires um, open societies, whether they're younger democracies, more established democracies, who are now coming to terms with their engagement with some of these very active and influential authoritarian regimes, to think about what they need to shore up to deal with the um, uh, some of the adverse byproducts of that engagement. Right. Some can say this is not a political move, it's economics, that you know, Chinese companies or others are out there just going out and investing like any other investors, and they do it differently. What connection do you make to the political leadership of the Communist Party? Why do you, what evidence is there that there is a strategy behind this that's political and not simply economic? You know, it's it's not even a strategy. I, I just think it's the way that the party operates. Mm -hmm. You know, the party operates above the law within mm -hmm. China, and it, it exerts a significant degree of influence over almost every aspect of life, whether that influence is visible or not. I think in, even in the case of private sector actors, and you can argue that there's been expansion in political and economic space and contraction in that over the years in China, but... Um, there's always the influence of the party, and as long as the party is able to coerce 
the different elements of society, you can't divorce it from the conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't think there will ever be a purely economic or political decision that's made absent of any party influence when you're talking about some of these actors. Um, and I, I would just note, I think recently it's become just much more evident, you know, with the establishment of party committees and so on within private sector companies. Um, you see this in publicly listed companies. And so it's, it's not even hidden. It's simply sort of an overt part of the way that the party establishes itself in, in economic life. Right. Now, we, we read about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the fact that the Chinese are uh, they're using new technologies, digital technologies, to, to survey, I mean, basically new surveillance states and artificial intelligence and, and such that start to move tiptoe towards an Orwellian world. Um, how are you seeing that manifesting itself in Chinese behavior globally? Are they they're exporting these things? Or is this, again, something simply that... Communist Party being the Communist Party, and they don't see any problem with this. Is there a, a normative aspect of this, strategic aspect of this? How is this manifesting itself globally? You know, I mean, I think for one thing, there's been some conversation about what's been happening within China, and I think you really see the bleeding edge of that um, with what's happening in Xinjiang, with what's happening with the Uyghurs. I think. Uh, I would really commend to everybody the recent Human Rights Watch report, which deconstructed essentially an app that was used by policing there, which um, categorizes varieties of behavior and then classifies people as suspicious or not. And mm -hmm. it is truly chilling. And that's where I think you really can say this is Orwellian. But I think as you then diffuse throughout the wider society within China and then outside of China's borders, you see different dimensions of this. And what I would emphasize is that it's not always that blatant mm -hmm. and that it's not always an Orwellian prospect. I think <clears throat> this is something that goes beyond the dimension of simply China and technology, but I think as we all over the world grapple with the impact of technology now and grapple with our own changing understanding of what we thought technology would bring, I think we, particularly in democratic societies, assume that technology would lead to greater openness, would, gre right. would lead to democratic opening and to sort of a deepening of democracy. And I don't argue that that's not possible. I think that is certainly possible, and you do still see that. But I think we're much more aware now of some of the ways in which technology can be utilized, not just by authoritarian actors, but by a host of you know, other actors, private companies, and so on in ways that then condition the environment and, and enable greater surveillance practices and so on. And I think just to pick up on something that Chris mentioned, I think when you're talking about countries, societies, regions that don't have these basic democratic checks and balances to, to understand better how these technologies are being made use of, that's where authoritarians can come in, promotion of technology for surveillance and so on, without those checks and balances and without the debate about aspects like privacy, civil liberties, and so on that we are having very robustly in places like the U.S. and Europe right now. Right. And I, would, I think yeah. in, the, in the context of uh, you know, the U.S. And, and European countries, for example, the debates are really hard and the issues are moving quickly. But as uh, Xiao Chang in the January 2019 issue of the Journal of Democracy observed, what China has put in place is really multifaceted and there's no meaningful debate or checks on the authority's power to advance these things. And so it's a combination of some of the issues we've been discussing, just the, the general ability to manage to a significant degree the digital space, the incorporation of facial recognition, various other elements of artificial intelligence and integrating the DNA databases in the country that are at the disposal of the authorities and fusing these in a way that really gives um, some quite uh, chilling capacity to the authorities to monitor and track um, the population. And I think on this count, at least as we're looking at the AI issue now, uh, the countries that are able to gather, collect, and curate the most information are the ones that are able to most rapidly advance the learning and hence the application of AI. And clearly this is something that China is doing mm -hmm. and probably in ways that are um, not, uh, they're, they're not as uh, replicable in societies that have 
checks and accountability. And this is also something I think open societies have to reckon with. Right. No, we're struggling with that. It's always been a balance, certainly since 9-11, we talk about the balance between free speech and openness and national security. And with digital technologies, it becomes even more of a hard call. There's probably not a police or military force anywhere that wouldn't accept a greater ability to oversee what goes on uh, on the streets so that they can police. But uh, China has no such concern, I guess. They have no such domestic constraints. Um, the Economist talks about a new Cold War, a new kind of Cold War, actually is what they call it. Um, you talk about, Shanti, very normative, value-based, fundamental difference between the Chinese Communist Party and the West and certainly the United States. Um, do you agree that we're, I mean, what is the difference between what we're facing with China today and what we faced with the Soviet Union before? Um, and is it fair to say that we're under a long-standing and long-term competition with China? You know, I think we have struggled with the, the framing for this concept. And, and to be honest, I mean, I think I would say there's certainly competition in the realm of values. But I think that there are significant differences now than there were during the Cold War. And one of them has been um, the impact of globalization and technology, which has really not only sped up communications, it's sped up the ways in which societies are interdependent, intertwined, and connected. And that is really a fundamental change from the past. So I don't know that those previous rubrics for understanding the relationships between countries really make sense anymore. Um, and you know, people will call it whatever they want. I think for me it comes down to how do democratic societies choose to define their own values and principles and how then do you defend those um, at home, essentially? Mm. You know, that's part of what the sharp power concept and report gets to, which is it's not it's not only looking at the projection of authoritarian influence, but where the rubber hits the road is where publishers, as Chris mentioned, universities, other educational institutions, all the, the various elements of civil society that make a democratic society robust. That's where those institutions have to decide how do you uphold our own values. You know, if you are confronted with a situation in which you are being pressured to take certain topics off the table, how do you respond? Mm -hmm. So to me, that really comes down to fundamental decisions made within open societies. Mm -hmm. You know, that you could almost take the other player off the table yeah. and just really get down to brass tacks within the institutions of democratic society. And that's something that, regardless of how things are framed or regardless of who the other party is, um, I think will be with us for a long time. Right. Well, I mean, w are there examples, Chris, of where either at home here in the U.S. or abroad, that folks have tackled this wisely, smartly, or, or coming up with solutions to a, a huge challenge that we're going to face for a while, which is strong economic reasons to, to self-censor because of relationships with China, universities, who small universities who rely on Chinese students to pay full freight, or academics who need access to China, et cetera. What are some of the recommendations for how you deal with that kind of challenge? Well, I think Shanti started to um, hint at some of this. In my, my sense is that um, you know, right now we're in this period where we have both systems competition but also systems integration. So for example, a distinction between now and say 40 years ago is the, the depth of engagement, uh, the depth of um, intersection between China and not just the United States but dozens and dozens of uh, free societies around the globe is just enormous. And it's in so many domains that in some respects we need to rethink um, what our own standards are. And I think this is really critical to this understanding. Shanti mentioned a number of the um, spheres in which this is needed, but I think it's, um, it's something that happened incrementally over the years, often with uh, the best of intentions. This idea that you know, we all become better by economically engaging. What's to argue with? The more e economically interdependent we are, the, m the more mutual benefit there is. What's to argue with? I think what's happened in the meantime is that we've seen this isn't just about dollars and cents, that there are sacrifices that have to be made. For example, if you want to get published in the mm -hmm. PRC, yeah. there's certain things you're going to have to sacrifice if you're keen to get in there. Uh, there's been not enough work on this, but some uh, important work 
on the calculations that Hollywood makes in this regard as to what actually makes the cut to reach uh, audiences in China. And I think we have to reflect hard on at what point we um, really start to lose the foundations of our, of our own bottom line on these sorts of issues. And so it's going to take some, I think, recognition that this is a meaningful global challenge that's impacting not only North America and European Union countries, but a host of countries in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. Southeastern Europe, and elsewhere, and that uh, free societies are all in this together. And I think if, if we were to understand it, it's, it's not a geographic question. It's a, it really is a values question. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ask people in Taiwan how they feel about this. Right. For them, it's a values question. They're trying to preserve their system and their way of life in the face of um, some very serious encroachment with a dramatically different vision of how uh, governance should be used. And that's just one example, but yeah. an important one. No, 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 absolutely. And it's as much about, as you say, a positive agenda of norms. What are the positive uh, norms and values that we want to see in the world versus an anti-China thing? It's not necessarily anti-China. It's simply we don't like what China is peddling around the world, the norms that they are spreading through the Communist Party influence. Uh, but you, you lay out, Chris, this uh, notion that the, the world, we all have to sort of wake up to what's going on. Do you see that happening? Do you see it, that there has been progress in recent years? Are folks recognizing the challenge more and more? Uh, and even if they do, are they simply vulnerable to it anyway because of the need to engage China and get the benefits of engagement of China? I think there's better understanding today than there was two or three years ago, as one example. Um, and understanding to some meaningful extent is a prerequisite for devising responses that are consistent with democratic values uh, in the way that you're suggesting, I think. Uh, in the absence of that understanding and in the absence of that awareness raising, it's hard to imagine that free societies will be able to respond in a serious way. I think if you look at one case study that is uh, useful, it's Australia. Mm -hmm. And Shanti and I have written about this. I think um, you know, Australia as a democracy discovered not all that long ago that many of the sectors and many of the spheres we've been discussing had some real issues. Uh, it ranged from their media sector to their political sector to their university sector, relatedly to the tech sector and on and on. And the nature of the relationship, as I understand it from Australian colleagues, the nature of the relationship that they had with China and the Chinese authorities was unsustainable, not in an economic sense, but in a political integrity sense, uh, in, the, in the context of people being able to talk about certain issues. The most um, graphic example of this, perhaps, was uh, Clive Hamilton's inability to have a publisher produce his book, Silent Invasion, which is just one example. But I think it was instructive in what was happening in a free society. And so they underwent a process which, in, sh in summary, was some very um, able and courageous thinkers and journalists putting key issues into the public domain, which in turn got greater public attention society-wide, which then got some debates and public hearings in the parliament, which then translated into more public discussion and some proposed legislative approaches and regulatory approaches. Uh, not all of those have been adopted. Some were, some weren't, some are being amended. But I think that, just as a very uh, practical democratic response, is will have to play out to one degree or another in other societies that have these quite comprehensive and um, important relationships with China. Right. And Shanti, is, are we doing enough in the U.S., do you feel? Are we, <laughs> are we starting this, uh, this getting on the road? Are we going too far? I mean, some can say that uh, our response to China is, is too far and um, extreme, in essence. Do you agree? You know, I probably can't speak to the intricacies of U.S. policy at the moment. Um, you know, one area where I think all democracies have to be careful is in making sure that there is a clear distinction between referring to the Chinese party state and the Chinese people, whether mm -hmm. it's the Chinese people within China or people of ethnic Chinese descent all around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be one area in which I think 
you know, there does need to be great care and that I think in all policy discussions it's important to use a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer to really deal with very specific problems and specific issues that pose a challenge to democracy. Um, but that we shouldn't, we shouldn't conflate a broad-based backlash, and particularly against people of ethnic Chinese descent, um, with addressing these very real problems to democracy, syst you know, systematic challenges that Chris and I have been discussing. Right. And, and you, you followed China for a long time, and, and just ask you more of a I mean, an academic question. Is this an, an issue of Xi Jinping? You seem to suggest it's a Communist Party. It's essential to the Communist Party. But I'm sure there are some who China scholars, others who say, well, this is Xi Jinping making certain choices. It didn't have to go in this direction. Um, do you see this as fundamental to the Chinese Communist Party, or is it a Xi Jinping issue? That's a hard question. It is I know. a hard question. I'm going to punt it to all the China scholars <laughs> out there. I mean, my you'll own, get a debate, I'm sure, among <laughs> them. There will be plenty of yes. debate. You know, it. Um, Chris was just mentioning that he had uh, read a book recently, or he was looking, rereading a book called *The Party* by Richard McGregor, which really outlines the key dimensions of the right. party. It was written about uh, eight or nine years ago, yeah. I think. Um, I honestly think that the fundamental characteristics of the Chinese Communist Party haven't really changed. I think that the ways in which it's expressed that power within China have changed, and again, there have been periods of opening, and then greater periods of closing, and I think. With Xi Jinping, my impression is he just made some of the subtext text in ways that people weren't anticipating mm -hmm. and transitioned from sort of the hide and bide period to not really hiding and not biting very much at all. Right. Um, but that, again, is a matter of degree. And I think you can find elements of consistency between Xi and Hu and, you know, a, a number of Chinese leaders before that. Right. I agree with you. This is going to be an issue of debate, I think, among many China scholars. It's hard to find a, a definite answer. Um, one Belt, One Road, and people know a lot about that, and that China is building infrastructure globally. Um, why should we find that a challenge? The world needs infrastructure. What is it about One Belt, One Road that people should be concerned about, given authoritarian influence uh, that we're talking about? So. Uh Shanti is the real expert on this. I would just share a brief observation and say uh, some of this we've alluded to earlier in, in the podcast, and I think that is the um, tendency in the wider engagement that goes beyond purely the commercial, the dollars and cents dimension, is to um, suppress certain forms of discussion or otherwise restrict um, the sort of scrutiny that is um, needed and welcome in so many instances to make sure you get the best sort of outcome for the local society. And I think what we're hearing from partners and from other uh, interlocutors is that uh, apart from the specific examples I provided earlier in places like Kenya and Ecuador um, and Argentina and so forth, um, it really does seem to be a pattern that there's often uh, for one reason or another, insufficient scrutiny or sunlight on the way these deals are arranged. And that's not even suggesting at the outset that they may be problematic. I think there's a more fundamental issue of whether civil society, civil society ordinary people, uh, the full policy community in countries that are engaging in the BRI um, know what they're getting into. And I think there's an increasing body of evidence to suggest that at least in a significant number of these instances, wider society doesn't really understand it. And on the back end of this, that's when we really see the problems where people say, hey, we didn't realize we were going to be on the hook for this, or we didn't realize that our own uh, people wouldn't be able to participate in the project. And I think the best, the best thing for all of the parties concerned, certainly for the local societies, is to have as clear and informed understanding of this engagement as possible. And I'd say if I put one big issue out there on the BRI, that would be the one I think is worthy of more, um, more attention. Yeah, it gets to the words that we always use in democracy, transparency and accountability, I suppose. Yeah, transparency and accountability, but again, sort of with an informed transparency and accountability, mm -hmm. um, because I, you know, I think it's easy to default to those terms in the democracy support community, but really um, it, it has to be also informed by an awareness of the Chinese government, 
and it's it's strategies you know yeah. it, it can't just be in a vacuum right so why should we care in America how do you connect what's going on in the world what China's doing with one belt one road and the interests of the United States how, why does it matter to the average American citizen what China is doing whether it's with infrastructure or with broader norms and values globally? You know, I think this used to be a conversation that would be had mainly among the community of people that really cared about human rights in China. And it was a very passionate group and dedicated group of people, but it, that conversation tended to stay within that circumscribed group. And I think as the Chinese government started to expand overseas and as integration and the interdependence between China and open societies increased, that conversation started to spread outward from that small community of people. Naturally, because, as a, you know, I think I've emphasized earlier in some of my remarks, the, the authoritarian character of the Chinese government's actions expresses itself whether it's at home in China or whether it's acting overseas. And so this isn't really a distant concern. You know, I think people, personally, I think people should be concerned objectively and absent any other concern about what's happening with the Uyghur population in China. That is absolutely a huge human rights crisis. But beyond that, the Chinese government is also taking those techniques of oppression that it's learned and refined among that population and applying that throughout the world. And it's taking that desire to suppress conversation about issues it feels sensitive, again, around the world. And when that impinges upon the ability of people within open societies to discuss, frankly and openly, Taiwan or Tibet or Tiananmen, because we're at the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen, we should be having those conversations in open societies. And if in open societies we're feeling pressure to not discuss these issues in a frank manner because of the Chinese government's pressure, then that is naturally of concern to us. And it should be of concern to all of us in democratic societies. And so again, I would sort of bring the lens back to us as democracies to better understand how these efforts impinge upon what we've already committed to as our ideals and then defend those ideals. It really is about democratic societies in the end and democratic resilience. Right. And, and Chris, you had mentioned Taiwan earlier and there's also Hong Kong and Shanti, you were based in Hong Kong for, for many years. Um, they're in some ways right on the front lines, and you can call them the canaries in the coal mine. If, as they start to deal with these Chinese threats, I mean, Hong Kong is no longer really one country, two systems. They're steadily becoming one country, one system. Um, what can we learn from that? Uh, does it really matter what happens in those two places? And what are they facing, particularly in Taiwan? It matters enormously. I think, as you rightly point out, Derek, the, you know, the experience uh, of people in those settings uh, dealing on a daily basis with the full complement of um, instruments and efforts to uh, shrink freedom of expression or otherwise manipulate the political space, and it happens in different ways in the different settings, um, is something now, as Shanti I think just very uh, eloquently alluded to, is now rolling out in different ways in other parts of the world. And it's not to suggest that it's exactly the same or it can be done uh, exactly the same way in other places, but it is to suggest that the, uh, the kind of animating principles behind it will try to find the space where the space is permitted. And that's why, um, in my view, all of the democracies are in this together. It's a, it's a question of um, solidarity. It's a question of um, finding ways to deal with things collectively so that it's not as easy to be uh, put into a divide and conquer uh, sort of situation, which we see both at the institutional level. No one wants to be the university that loses out mm -hmm. on the resources right. unless you know that somehow there's some method to protect you as well as all the other participants in the sector. Very hard to do that. Similar with countries. I'll just jump to Central and Eastern Europe with the 16 plus 1. Um, it's really not 16 plus 1 as we know. It's, it's 1 plus 1 times mm -hmm. 16. It's 16 bilateral relationships. And part of that effort is to um, not have unity among the countries in the 16. And I think we can learn something from that. To the extent we're more unified behind our own values and we can find ways where circumstances allow to operate in a more unified and collective way, 
to meet the sort of challenges to our values, uh, we'll be much better equipped to do that. And in that respect, um, the challenges we see in places like Taiwan and Hong Kong should be a reminder to all of us. Yes, well, I, I completely agree. And that's classic Chinese strategy. If you look at the, the classical ways that Imperial China dealt with external threats or challenges, it was about breaking up the alliances and taking folks one by one in order to gain advantage. So nothing new there. Um, but what we do at the NED and NDI is all about democratic solidarity. It's about partnerships and building connections between our institutions as well as with those all around the world, uh, small d Democrats that are fighting for that human dignity and that uh, freedom and openness and transparency um, so they can have uh, they can, they can have control of their own societies. So anyway, thank you very, very much to both of you, Chris and Shanti, for a really stimulating conversation. Again, in the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square um, uh, demonstrations in China. And I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us. Uh, share DemWorks, both our podcasts and our videos on social media, to amplify the voice of our democratic and democracy heroes. For more details about NDI and its work, including our new 35th anniversary report, fresh off the presses, go to ndi.org. And while you're there, sign up for our monthly newsletter. I'm Derek Mitchell, and this has been DemWorks. Thank you for listening.